that's right. I guess not. Okay. I um I just did, I know I'm early. I'm seven minutes early. We're gonna get started here in a little bit. Um, I just want to make sure that I don't have any um, issues in streaming. So bear with me. And welcome to uh, Thursday's Tech Talk. Um, Thomas Dimitrovich here, and um, hopefully we're gonna we're gonna be talking about connectivity, the fundamentals of connectivity. We're gonna be we're live right now, so it's just myself. Um, but I am going to make sure that uh, I know I had some problems earlier this morning because last couple weeks I had a vacation week which I did nothing. <laughs> we did nothing. Bobby, Joe, and I, uh, we, we, we just tried to relax and uh, de-stress ourselves. So we did that. And, um, and then I had a week of the Michigan chapter of the International Association of Electrical Inspectors met. Uh, and I went there to do a uh, program on selective coordination and arc flash. Um, oops, and my yellow duck isn't, I'm gonna log in. And this is why I went a little bit early, because I have to, um, well, I'm not going to connect with that. That's okay. All right, so that one is out. I'm on four channels right now, so it looks like uh, YouTube is up and running. It looks like um, Twitter is up and running. LinkedIn is up and running, and Facebook is up and running. So Steve Froming in the house. Yes, um, we, you know, uh, Steve Froming, I took, uh, I, I've been um, playing with a new product that I, you're going to love this. I got a new toy. It's an ATEM Mini Pro. Ah, here it is, brother. It's an ATEM Mini Pro. Um, I wanted to learn about this because I'm trying to figure out how to um how to get uh the how to go live in an in-person meeting so i'm learning about this product which basically is it takes four hdmi inputs and an audio input and you can take audio from your hdmi feed as well so if you have a camera that has hdmi or if you have a computer output that you want to um share like a, a PowerPoint presentation. You can bring your PowerPoint in, you can bring a camera, but it has to have an HDMI input. And it will actually, you can connect the internet to it. You can connect a uh, ethernet wire to it, take it to a hub or whatever, and um, live stream straight from this device. So you don't need a computer at all. All you need is this. Uh, if you want to display a PowerPoint presentation, you need a computer, but your computer is not streaming. My laptop isn't good enough for that. So in any case, uh, hey, Ryan, uh, all is good here, brother. Uh, I'm glad to be back online again and glad to be back in the program. So, um, and today's topic is one that's near and dear to me because uh, it's on connectivity. I really enjoy that topic. And uh, I think that we will uh, we'll have a good discussion today. So um, I, it looks like I am streaming. I just, let me just double check because I had a problem this morning, Ryan. I went live and my YouTube just stopped after two minutes and I didn't even know it. Uh, I had no indication of that whatsoever. So I'm just gonna double check to make sure that I am still, I'm going. And I don't, you know, I, I, that's what happens. I, somebody, I think it was uh, Nihad or somebody sent, a couple of people sent me a note. All right, so I'm live there. So I think I'm going good. Somebody, a couple of people sent me a note and said, hey, what happened? And I'm like, I don't know. That's what uh, one week or two weeks of non-streaming will do to you. Mr. Smith, what up, brother? Let's pop that clutch. Did I say it right? I think I did. It's going to pop the clutch, brother. I, I got canceled. JW is here. Yes, the cancel culture is in the house. Uh, no, I didn't get canceled. I uh, I just decided to take a break, and I needed it. And I, I did that for a week, but I didn't think or plan on going to Michigan. I had to uh, help somebody out, so I went to Michigan to do a, a program on selective coordination and incident energy. It went great. Enjoyed my first 
um, my first presentation live uh, in person. I mean, that was um, it was it was actually it was really good to get back into the stream of things and it, and i think we're opening back up now because i mean there were a lot of people in michigan they re, they removed all the restrictions and everything so it was um it was looking really good i was really happy to see everybody again and you know what's funny ryan is there's like depth you know people aren't just flat you've actually you know you could you could actually touch them and it's amazing so i was i was i was pumped it was good Alrighty, so I just want to make sure I'm live on, yes I am, I'm live on LinkedIn as well. So welcome everybody, welcome to Tech Thursday. We are back in the house. Today's discussion is going to be on connectivity. I did not get a chance to cover it during self-declared energy month. Uh, we are in July now, I'm not sure what July is, but um, we're going to talk about we're going to build on our previous discussion. Remember last month, we had a few sessions there that talked about understanding what you're going to monitor and why you're going to need to monitor it, what data you're actually looking for. And today's discussion, we're going to be talking about how to get that information from a meter or from a uh, circuit breaker or possibly a switch or, or a relay, or it could be a programmable logic controller. It could be just about anything. There are so many solutions out there that we need that, that we could use to communicate with. And we, can, we have to think about where we want to take that information and what we want to do with that information. Uh, so what I'm going to do is walk us through a couple things. Uh, I want to walk through um, and I'm, I'm calling it power monitoring, but reality, what we're going to talk about right now is not just for power monitoring. Building management systems will use what we're talking about. Programmable logic controllers will use what we're talking about. I want to I want to go through some fundamentals. We're going to stick this to one hour, so it's six o'clock prompt. I'm shutting down this feed. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I got to get better at that. So we're gonna get, we're gonna get this done today. But I want to give you a foundation on things you need to think about when you have meters out there or relays or I/O input output uh, data points that you can bring back to wherever it is you're going to bring it to. It could be a programmable logic controller. It could be an HMI that's mounted, a human machine interface. It could be like an iPad type of looking device that's mounted on equipment. I wanna talk about all of those methods. In fact, in fact, having a little allergy issue today, but that's okay. Um, not this video. I've got another video queued up. I got a couple videos queued up. I thought I had a couple videos queued up. All right, Imagine so, having a bird's eye view of your power. Boom, let's do this. Now, um, and I'll, I'll try to put a link to this, but what I like about this from an overview, this short little video talks about all of the key things that you... We have data, we have meters, relays, things that communicate. They could be in, in, in an airport, every one of those terminals. Uh, there, there could be a lot of different places in, uh, in facilities across the country, campuses, uh, school campuses, industrial facilities. In industrial facilities with all of this hardware, and they have corporate headquarters that may not be in that location but we may want to pull back all of that information back to a dashboard that might be on a computer. It could be on an iPhone. It could be on, um, it could be on your iPad. Um, there are many places where I might want to view information that's associated with my power distribution system. Maybe it's giving me energy information. Maybe it is giving me, um, uh, uh, status, maybe I want to turn something on and off. You've got to think about who needs the information, what information do they need, 
how fast do they need it? How quickly? What's the response time? Do you want that person to, to, uh, to, uh, to click on something and have to wait five minutes to get a response back? Because we're, we're going to talk about the data processing times because we're going to get into communications. We're going to get into when you send a message, what does that message look like? What is the end device doing with that information? How does it send it back to you? How do you know the latency, the, the time delay that it takes from when I send a message and when I hear back from my device? Can I speed it up? Okay, um, how do I know when I may have hit a, a, a ceiling of, I may never hear a response back, okay? So we're gonna talk about all of these different issues, but it's really important, and we talked about this earlier, uh, last month, we talked about the fact that you need to know what it is that you want to communicate, who needs to see it, what they're going to do with it, okay? Um, another, another cool, uh, interesting video we have, which I think, I've played this one before uh, for everybody, and, and uh, what I like about this video itself is that Dan, I think it's Dan Carnavalli and uh, David Laux walks through metering solutions. Um, and there's some dialogue here in the beginning and all this jazz. So uh, now I'll just stop right here. Look at what's, what's on this piece of equipment. There is an, a, a display that has information. Obviously, it's got, uh, it says commercial bus, but you'll see uh, uh, almost a spreadsheet like look, like look of uh, information. Now, the big gray box that that display is mounted in doesn't necessarily mean the data that's on that display is coming from that big gray box. Because what we're going to talk about in this communications discussion is the fact that data can be shared throughout a distribution system depending upon your architecture and you've got to understand what it is you want to put on a display like that what would a person walking up to this equipment use that data for and then you've got to figure out how do you get the data from individual meters that might be that it's not far-fetched to say that the information being displayed on this equipment might not even be from equipment or meters or relays or data inputs that isn't in that building. It could be in an ancillary building. It could be in an outbuilding. It could be displaying data that might not even be in this facility or in this state. It could be from it could be from a facility or a multiple facilities from across a geographical location, and the questions that you have to figure out is how do you get that data from all of those locations to this display? And we're going to start simple, and we're going to ramp up, and this is going to be like an aerobic exercise. We're going to crescendo at the half hour, and then we're going to try to ramp it back down again. Um, so. And we're gonna we're gonna crescendo up, so we're we're gonna start slowly here. And I want to start with that thirty thousand foot view, and then we're gonna work us down to the details. And you'll notice that this uh, this graphics, this is an HMI, this is human machine interface on a computer. It's showing waveform data from a uh, it could be a a, a relay. And you'll notice that's a subtransient uh, type of event. That's a ring wave. That's probably from capacitor switching or some switching type of event. These waveforms, how do I get waveforms from a device back to a computer or to my cell phone? How do I get that, that information back to a computer that might not even be in that location? Maybe back to a display on the big gray box so I can view that information either on the assembly or maybe it's outside the room of where that assembly is i have a display like this that i can have all of that information i may want to take this information snap it out and send it to somebody maybe uh, this is um maybe this is uh, xyz manufacturing corporation and they've got our equipment and we have a relationship with them and xyz says hey i had this event and they want to take that snapshot of this profile and send it to me and i want to use that data maybe in a study 
I might uh, uh, take a trend information and look at it to say, hey, here's how I think you can save money based upon this information. And you want to share that information. How do I bring data points into Wonderware or Iconics, HMIs, or maybe a Johnson Controls Metasys system? How do I get data from a, a hardcore meter or a relay? How do I get individual amps, watts, VARs into a display like this that I created in a software application? I'm get, I'm I'm going to I'm going to give you your voltage. I'm going to show you the fluctuation, the history of your voltage. How do I get that? And that's the focus of what our discussion is today. I want to talk about all of the the hardware. So the the way I'm going to structure this discussion is and I'm going to play that video cuz if something comes up I want to talk about I want to talk about it. Um, I want to talk about the physical layers. I want to talk about the protocols. Now, physical layer, uh, if you think about the physical layer, you're talking about the wires. You're talking about the connectors. Uh, and sometimes the connectors are predefined for you. You can't pick them, right? Unless you're the design engineer and you're creating a, 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 a new calculator. Uh, you got this new uh, HP just hired you to create a calculator that you can put a connector into and put it onto the Ethernet LAN and whatever you calculate automatically goes into a database somewhere. There's another concept from a protocol perspective, databases. If you have data, what is the file format that you're storing the data in? Can you get it into an access database? Can you pull it into an Excel spreadsheet? Can, you, can your data be live and, and changing in an Excel sped, spreadsheet live at any point in time? Would you want to do something like that? All right, so we got James Smith, we got Ryan, we got Tamaki. Thanks for joining. Um, all the way from Japan. Yes, it's been a while. Chris Folan, thanks for joining us, buddy. And we got uh, JW. JW, I saw some questions and I answered some questions this morning, which didn't make it on YouTube. But what I'm going to do, I know you had some questions. I think you had questions on medium voltage stuff. I'm going to, uh, I'm, instead of trying to type them, I'm just going to create a video and go through all of my questions and answer and try to answer all of your questions. You had quite a few. So appreciate the feedback and the dialogue. Uh, I will get to those as best I can. So uh, we're going to talk about the physical layer, the protocol layer. This, remember, uh, you, this is, and we talked about this already last month. I did a session on this where we said if I, for example, if Tamaki Ono in Japan did not speak English and I'm trying to talk, we would have a problem with communicating. They would, that Tamaki would see my hands going, would see my lips moving, would hear sounds, but would not be able to understand what the heck I'm saying unless either Tamaki understood the language that I was speaking or if Tamaki had an interpreter, something in between us. Um, hey, JW, keep those questions coming. Don't worry about it. That, that, we all learn from those. So really good, really good questions too. And some good statements. So we're going to talk about the protocols and we're going to talk about when I have a string of, say, uh, a bunch of devices that all talk different languages. Okay, we're going to talk about the architecture on how I need to deal with that architecture to simplify it, streamline it, and get it into one common interface. So that ought to be a really good discussion as well. And then you have the HMI. The HMI basically is um, is is you know what David is talking about here you look at these uh, at these screens behind him you've got uh, he's got waveforms being displayed there he has uh, those voltage thresholds he's got trend data being displayed all of this information has got to come from somewhere and the source of the data is probably a meter a circuit breaker or something that's out there that's displaying or, or capturing the data. And you've got to figure out how do you get that data back to a computer, into a database. Look, look at these meters. You take a look at the, the meter that's over his shoulder. All right. So this device right in here is, is a meter. You have a, um, 
you have a negative sequence voltage that's a relay you have a relay here and you have a of some sort of either a relay or a me or a meter uh, by looking at the back of it i can't tell it might be actually a relay uh, it could be a phase over current relay it could be a over voltage relay it could be some sort of that uh, type of a relay but it, it has you'll notice all of the the wires back there uh, these are for the most part low voltage wiring in 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 those big blue cables very well could be ethernet 10 base t uh, type of connections we're going to talk about those connections and the wires that you're used for that you need to pay attention to a couple things one the voltage rating two the listing requirements the listing of those cables and three how you shield and bond um, and and ground the shields of those wires do you bond do you do you ground the shields on both ends of the wire or only on one end of the wire we're going to talk about that in some reference booklets for you for for that discussion uh, in the in our one hour session so this is where it all starts though you're going to have a meter that's going to collect the data that you need and you need to figure out how to get it back and in in, in that journey you need to know the wires the connectors how do you plug into the meter is it an rj type of connector that you push in and plug do you have to wire a twisted pair does it need to be a twisted shielded pair um, and then you're going to need to wire that back to uh, something that's going to communicate and take the data uh, a, a, um, a device that's going to ask it questions ask that meter say hey what is the status of your voltage and it's going to tell it the voltage you're it's going to say hey you captured a waveform give me that file and it's going to send the file and then and then whatever it is that's asking it needs to take that file and do something with it maybe it simply puts it in an ftp server on deck or maybe it puts it up on a server somewhere in a database we we're going to talk about all of that as we uh, as we go through this discussion so let us first talk about the physical layer. Now, what I'm showing here are uh, meters and relays, all connected together, and I, I, I'm calling it an RS-485 network. Uh, and and I, you'll notice it says a Belden 3106A, and a Belden 3106A is, I don't even know if that's a, Belden 3106. I don't even know if that's a, an existing product because this is, uh, you know, I'm, I used to do this back in the day. 3106 Belden wire. So it is a Belden wire. Page not found. Look at that. Uh, this is how you know you're live. Let's try this one. There we go. Belden wire, there's a picture of it. Uh, I gotta tell it where I'm at. Um, 3106A, and look, it's got, uh, there's actually three conductors in this one. All right, and then you, I believe you can, um, I believe you can get this in different types of, of um, whether it's two wire, three wire, etc. So, the 3106, and I think there's another catalog number as well, but you need to think about this, and you'll notice there's a, and this is sort of how we designate the shield will be grounded. You'll always want to ground it at one end, uh, not both ends, because you'll have circulating currents. Now, the other thing to be mindful, you'll notice I have the 120 ohm termination resistor. Why do we have termination resistors in a data communication system? You think about what we're doing when we're communicating over this Belden uh, wire, a twisted shielded pair. I'm sending a, and some of these are frequency shift key. What do we mean by frequency shift key? Frequency shift key is I have a, a common amplitude and I'm changing between two frequencies, meaning the faster, the, the higher the frequency, the more uh, cycles I get in a shorter period of time, the longer the frequency, the, uh, uh, the, the, the less cycles I get in a period of time. The data communication, my ones and my zeros, remember in communications, when you're talking, this is fundamental stuff, this is ones and zeros, and I might have a string of ones and zeros, and we'll talk about this, a string of ones and zeros that basically 
develops my my messages okay so if you think about a uh, when you think about the communications and the protocols because now i'm getting I'm, I'm skipping ahead a little bit here but i think it's important to understand that in cases i might be doing a frequency shift key whatever my communication methods i'm going to have uh higher frequencies and i have to think about I, I don't want a ring wave that, I don't want a wave that just goes back and forth on that line and keeps amplifying. I need to stop the communications at the end of that line and that's what that 120 ohm resistor does. Think of it as when you whip uh, a cord, did you ever do this with a, a cord and you whip it, uh, you'll see that waveform go down the line and then when it gets to the end, it flips like this, right? And it, it, it could go wild. You know, you've got that, hey, look at that, I got a dance going on, woo! So you get that flip going on and you want that flip to stop at the end. You don't want it to go wild. That's what that terminating resistor does. It stops the waveform and the Im impedance of that, the ohms of that have to match the source. So, um, Typically, that will be defined for you by the manufacturer of the communication system. So don't just try to come up with it on your own. You're going to want to go back to the manufacturer of the system that you're installing and say, what does my terminating resistor need to be? And if it's 120 ohms, you know, you could put 260 ohms in series with each other at the end of there. You could put two 240s in parallel, whatever you need to do to get to 120 ohms or whatever your terminating resistance needs to be. You need to terminate that signal. Uh, at the end of the line. So that's an important piece of the puzzle. Now this uh, happens to be a, a proprietary network communication system. Uh, and and I, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing an RS-485 network so it, that I could say this is a Modbus um, application. In many cases, it's a switch on the device you turn. Exactly, JW. You could have a switch on there that you turn on and off to tell it's the last uh, resistor. So it will depend upon the manufacturer. The manufacturer may tell you, hey, I have the terminating resistor on every one of my devices, or you need to put one in. I've worked on systems in the past where we had to carry resistors and uh, or you know take a tr take a trip to uh, Radio Shack to go get one. Um, but we, uh, you know, it will vary by manufacturer. Now, this is a Modbus uh, type of a network. It's an RS-45 network. And you'll notice I'm daisy chaining these in series with each other. Every one of these will have an address on the network. So you think about, you think about anything you put on a network. I don't care if it's a computer. Let's, let's just think about it from a computer perspective. What do we know about a computer? We know a computer has what? A TCP IP address. That could be 166.6.1.1.5. That can be your TCP IP address. And you may unplug your computer and plug it in again, and you may end up with an address of 166.1.1.12. Because when you unplugged it, other people took your previous IP address. It's an address. It, but the computer also has what they call a MAC address. And a MAC address is unique to the computer. It's like, it's like your name. Think about the MAC address of a computer as being your name. And the IP address, your TCP IP address being your, your house address. Because you could sell your home and move. You could you could leave your house, go to your neighbor's house, and now your physical address is your neighbor's uh, house's address, but you, your name has not changed. So a, a computer or anything that's on a Ethernet LAN will have a MAC address that doesn't change, and you have to register that, and you have to, you know, anything that's, you know, as a manufacturer, if I make a meter that connects directly to Ethernet, it's going to have a MAC address, and I have paid for that MAC address, and I'm allocated that MAC address. Nobody else can get my MAC address, uh, but my TCP IP address would change depending upon the network I'm plugged into, or, you know, maybe I power down and power back on, and it says, hey, I need an IP address. And it says you're 166.9.9.1. And I powered down, I powered back up again, and now I'm 166.9.9.2. Right? So, and now you can ask for a static IP address on the network, 
which in many cases when you're connecting systems on the ethernet LAN, you're going to need static IP addresses and we'll talk about that when we get to that. So does terminating resistor prevent information trying to enter the trunk? I don't know that I would look at that that way. The terminating resistor is like, it's like an anchor for a boat, it keeps things from bouncing all over the place. Uh, it keeps you from clobbering your data and your communications. You could be losing bits uh, in your communications. You could have error rates because you don't have that terminating resistor. It's causing a ring wave to flow back into the system and now, or a, a reflective wave, not a ring wave, but a reflective wave to clobber your communications and you need to terminate into that resistance. Uh, your social security number, yes. Uh, we all have an individual social security number. No two are the same, and you know, unless we want to get someone, you know, get someone a credit card. So, in any case, you look at this system. Now, what are some unique things about this system? Every one of these devices, if it's on a Modbus network, every one of these have a Modbus address. Um, and there'll be uh, typically little dials that you'll change, you'll program them on the back of each of these devices. You might be able to, in some cases, depending upon the sophistication of the meter or relay or whatever it is that's on the Modbus network, because it doesn't have to be a meter or relay. A relay. It could be um, uh, Modbus, um, I don't know, Modbus devices. So I'm just looking at uh, I'm just I'm just googling uh, Modbus devices and uh, you'll get let's just go to p images <coughs> you know you have a net 485 you got this manufacturer who makes the device you got a little brick here that probably takes input outputs uh, you've got uh, Modbus RTU devices. Uh, you've got these little devices that'll probably bring uh, inputs and outputs. You might have uh, data, you, meters. So there are a lot of different devices that you could put on a Modbus network. They'll all have an individual uh, address and you can mix manufacturers as long as they adhere to the Modbus communication protocols. You could, an inverter, um, you could have uh, just about anything that communicates on Modbus. You could put those on the same system, but they have to behave, okay? And when I say behave, I mean they have to adhere to the protocol. So if you think about, and when I say, pro, I, I mean protocol in more dimensions than one. Protocol could be the communication that we all speak English. Okay, so let's say that every one of these little meters up here speak English and one of them speaks Spanish and doesn't speak English. What does that mean? That means that when the Modbus master who's sending out a command in English, the one that speaks Spanish is not going to understand any of the messages. It's probably just going to sit there quietly. Unless it follows a different protocol that says, hey, I'm going to talk whenever I want to talk. And it starts spewing out Spanish on the same network of all these other English speaking devices. Now you're going to clobber the communications between the master and the other devices because you're not behaving. You're talking when you have, you're not supposed to talk. So you have to follow the protocols both in the language to understand you're listening for a message that A is your address, say you're the third one on there and you're your uh, Modbus address three, you're going to look for, you're going to see every message that comes across and you're going to be looking and reading every one of those messages. But when you see an address that is says three, say it's the first three data points, uh, the bits in the message, if well, maybe it's, not, it's probably not going to be the first three uh, bits, it's probably going to be somewhere in there. Uh, it, it, say it's a string of 12 bits, the first bit might be a control bit, the second, the next three bits might be the address, and then the next three bits or four bits might actually be the message, and then you'll have some tailing bits to say, hey, the message is over, right? So you'll have a, a, a string of bits that will tell you how to communicate and if you understand Modbus and you're a device hanging on the Modbus network, you're listening to all the things when, and you're interpreting all the information, the moment you see your address, you're gonna go, this is for me. You're gonna take that message out. You're gonna read it. 
you're going to say, okay, I know you want voltage. You're going to grab voltage and send a message back. No one else is going to send a message. No one else can talk in this master, uh, master slave type of environment where you have a Modbus master that's sending a message out and you have each of these devices that have to listen. Only the device you are broadcasting to is supposed to respond. Only one device at any time. You can't have the other devices just talking out of turn. That's a following the protocols. So uh, would a daisy chain backbone for the network be a first choice? Uh, I don't know that it, you know, my thought process, James, is it's a choice and sometimes it's chosen for you depending upon the devices and the network, the types of equipment that you're buying. Um, I like the ring. So uh, there's, there is a, uh, there is a, this process where you just have the straight line out and all of those are communicating. If I, if I break a conductor in the middle, then I don't communicate to the rest of them. I just communicate to the first two. Uh, there are other uh, architectures where you have like a ring, so to speak, where if I break anything, I'm still going to be able to communicate. There are different redundancies and whatnot. Um, but a daisy chain, I would say, is probably the most common that I've come across. Um, any Modbus networks and um, pretty much... I mean, even in the proprietary networks, uh, that's the way things are, have done been done that I've seen. That's where my my uh, history comes from. All right, so if I just look at this, I I know that I'm going to have a wire, and I'm going to have to think about terminations of that wire. And I'm going to have to think about the shields and grounding the shield and daisy chaining the shield. I don't want to ground the shield on both ends. I don't show that termination over here that of the shield going to ground over on this side as well or anywhere else in this network. I only ground it in one location. And a good reference for you is the IEEE Emerald Book. IEEE Emerald, E-M-E-R-A-L-D, Emerald Book. Okay. Uh, the IEEE Emerald Book is the recommended practice, I'm going by memory, for powering and grounding electronic equipment. I, um, when I was doing the uh, security system at Crystal River Unit 3, had a lot of, I uh, had a Johnson Controls uh, system, I think it was Johnson Controls, uh, all of the control boxes, and I had signaling and data wires going everywhere. Uh, I had, I, uh, this was a very good reference document uh, that you should have in your library if this is what you're doing. It helps you understand how to bond and ground those data lines so that you don't have interference, you don't have circulating currents, and you have a good strong data signal. Because remember, ones and zeros. I screw up one of those digits, I screw up my entire message and I have to throw it away. I don't know, I don't believe you would, You. I mean, it would probably be a very rare a case where a uh, date one of my ones and zeros was uh, modified such that I communicated with the wrong device because I just changed I just so happened changed one digit uh, that uh, changed the address but uh, I think you'll have more of a chance of clobbering the entire message and making it useless uh, where nobody would understand it uh, because of the um, uh, errors in the uh, and the waveforms and whatnot. So this is a very important reference for you in regard to understanding the grounding of those signal wires. Um, so that is basically a daisy chain network. Now the physical layer. Um, one of the, the one of the concepts, and, and I'm not sure if it's. I, 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 this actually is a protocol discussion, but I'll talk about it right now. Baud rates. Um, when you have a, a baud rate, it's it's basically how fast I'm transferring data over communications. 9600, I mean, 9600 baud. Think about that. 9600 bits per second. Um, that I mean, this goes back in time. Our baud rates in today's uh, internet and whatnot are much faster. Uh, the pipe is much larger. But if you're down at the at the RS45 physical layer. Uh, you're doing, say, a frequency shift key type of communications that's going to be in, in these, you know, 14.4 was another one. You just keep doubling it, I believe. 
There's your belt in 9463. Uh, and you have two conductors there. Those other two whites are uh, items are spacers. Uh, and the reason they put those in is because if you when you get into communications, you're dealing with frequencies, higher frequencies. <laughs> the dogs are barking. Um, you're dealing with frequencies. And what happens there is you need to make sure that you are spaced evenly because the fields will cancel. OK, um, field theory, magnetic field theory. And there's a book on. Um, Oh, man, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. It's an older book that talks about transmission line theory, but the same concepts are there in, in how fields cancel each other. So they'll put these spacers in to make sure that they have uh, exactly the, they're configured the same. And you'll notice there's a shield, there's a drain wire, uh, there's the foil shield around there. So you want to shield your data communications. You don't want interference because you're dealing with frequencies, higher frequencies that are that could uh, clobber your message. Uh, now, RS-232 wire, you'll notice that in an RS-232 network, um, those these are going to be those nine pin connectors. Um, I think there's a nine, there's a, there's a nine pin. I think there's a 12 pin. I don't know, 24, I, I can't remember. I, I think I have some, some pictures of those. Uh, you'll see these when you're like connecting printers, right? So we all have, and, and, and the nine pins, um, um, boy, before USB, that was very popular for connecting just about anything to a computer, right? USB has sort of displaced those, but the RS-232 is still prevalent in a lot of your industrial environments. Uh, this still a technology that is used in those world. And you've got to think about the physical wires, the shielding uh, and, um, and insulation rating of those, or what the, the voltage rating if you're running these communication lines in with other power cables or around other power cables you've got to have the right right voltage ratings uh from a perspective of you know protection of those conductors and all that good stuff so um and the and the proper shielding and you have to have the right colors and the right um number of conductors and then you have your you know your ethernet wires which are have your RJ45 connectors at the end. Uh, you'll have your telephone wires too, RJ11s, I believe. Those are what those are. Uh, your physical layer is important to understand the wires that you're using, the voltage ratings of those wires, where you can and cannot route those wires, and, um, and the shielding and bonding of those. Another good reference for you, this is a, a green book, so it's kind of hard to, uh, to see. But it is understanding data communications. I'm gonna actually, I don't even know. This isn't, I bought this a long time ago. This was like my go to reference. Uh, I'm gonna see if it's out there on Amazon. Understanding data communications. Understanding Data Communications by Gilbert. Yep, there it is. There, and there's a new uh, sixth edition. This one is probably... Uh, <laughs> I love it. So this, they're on the sixth edition, and this is a first edition. So uh, this is an oldie, but a goodie. Um, here it is here. Understanding Data Communications. It's only $17.50 on Amazon. Um, I think it, in my opinion, it's a paperback and in my opinion, it, I know the first edition was absolutely awesome. Um, and what this book does for you, if you're into this type of communications, it will talk about all of the, um, hardware, all of your, your fiber optic. And I didn't even put fiber, but fiber is another option. Um, your local area network. So it, it has all of the information in here about all of your conductors and um, the, uh, all of the, the, the physical information about, uh, um, about frequency shift key and all the different um, communication methods over these wires about modems and intelligent modems. And I'm sure 
the latest version will cover all of the latest technologies. Um, but you'll have your RS-232, all of your pinouts will be in here, your plugs and your jacks, the physical layer cables. There's a chapter in here called, what is this chapter seven? Cables and connectors. Uh, you know, it's funny as you just, you'll, you, you can see where you spend a lot of time, especially in a paperback book because it just opens to those pages. Um, but you'll have the pinouts for all of your cables and for RS-232 and whatnot. Um, and all your RJ45s, your RJ11s, your you know your telephone stuff. You uh, another important piece of the puzzle that I used very frequently. Uh, this was I don't even know if black box is in in business anymore, but this is a um, uh, is a tri-state plus or whatever this is. So what you would do is you basically pull out your ribbon cables on both sides and uh there were different connectors i have different connectors for this but uh and and, and you have your your pinouts tells you what's transmit and receive uh it has a um a, a little jumpers that you can manually jumper out because remember your when you get down to this physical layer all of the pins on these conductors you know every wire uh, like in this case, this is a USB. You have the orange, the blue, the white, and the green. Orange has your voltage. Uh, blue is your blue and your green, plus and minus data, and your white is your ground. Uh, you would think the green would be the ground, but that's not the case. Might be for a different topic, but I'd like to see some examples of cables that are so rated to be shared with power voltage systems. I didn't think there was a cable that was suitable for that. Yeah, and the, that Belden wire, um, that I was talking about, I think it's Belden 9463. Belden 9463. I'm just going to pull this up. Catalog Belden 9463. So here is, uh, we call, it's called Blue Hose, all right? Um, Blue Hose for Data Highway Plus, one pair of, of 20 American wire gauge. Um, PE insulation, blue and clear, overall belt foil. <clears throat> Harsh environment, uh, Allen Bradley data, data Highway, a communication interface between PLC processors. So this is made for that type of environment. Let's take a look at the voltage rating on it. I think it's 300 volt rated. So uh, UL, AWM, 2464, 300 volt rated. So um, in, in, in many cases, this is going to be suitable. Look, NEC UL compliance, Article 725, Article 800, uh, Class 2. So uh, Belden 9463, I'll tell you, I used a lot of that wire in communicating when we would do our communications with our meters, uh, putting that in equipment. We would put Belden 9463 in our uh, switchboards and panel boards and things of that nature. Um, so, and, and it's a good, uh, robust made for that type of application. So, uh, JW, I would, in fact, what I would suggest is you can always call Belden. And um, I, I, I know we used a lot of Belden wire back in the day. I'm not sure. And when I say back in the day, I'm talking, I started eating in nine, January of 1996. And from January of 1996 through 2000, early 2000, um, you could share it except for limited circumstances when terminating. It is a power limited circuit. Oh, um, yeah, so RS-45, all of these types of communications are power limited type of applications. Um, you're, you're talking very low voltages, but freq different frequencies. So um, there's a... Uh, and, and, and you're into article, you're into chapter eight type of wiring and 725, article 725. So, but you can check those those wires out and uh, for communications, like I say, we used that a lot in assemblies. Now we've got some, lim we've got, um, we've got some uh, UL, uh, like when we put our meters and whatnot inside of it, a piece of equipment, we'll use that blue hose and it's all listed as an assembly and tested that way. Um. Yeah, seven twenty-five dot one thirty-six. Thank you, Ryan. Good, good, uh, good reference. 
So if you look at that, uh, like a USB cable, you'll see there's a, a drain wire, you'll see the braid, the foil shields are common, and you've got to know how to terminate and ground and, and, and pull those all together and take those to ground. And this is just, again, this is just looking at USB cable, uh, uh, talking about the size and the conductor and the materials and things like that. You're not typically going to be routing USB wires through a, through equipment. USB is something that you would, like I have here, that is uh, going to connect, say, a handheld device to communicate. Um, and your voltage rating is only 30 volts on those. Now here's your different CAT cables. You have CAT3, CAT5, 5E, 6, 6A, 7, 7A, and, and, and you'll see that there's uh, the, the weather uh, from a shielding perspective, your maximum transmission speed and your bandwidth uh, capabilities, you're gonna be picking the cables to suit the applications that you're working with. Um, and, and I think that's an important piece of it because if you pick the wrong cable, you could lose your data communications, you could uh, corrupt your data, and you could end up, you know, having, it, you know, it's like it's like buying a Ferrari and putting a, the wrong engine in it, right? Put a Chevy uh, small block into a Ferrari. Um, it's just not designed for it. And you've got a great looking, fast looking car, but it's not going to perform as well because you didn't put the right engine in it. Um, so uh, the details, the level of details around the grounding, the bonding, the type of cable and connectors that you use is critical. Uh, you have RS-232, 485, you could have a twisted pair, twisted shielded pair, uh, fiber optics I have over there. Uh, your physical layer can be many different types of formats uh, and uh, you know, I got uh, category three and what's the, the, the one that right behind me is USB. There are a myriad of uh, solutions that you can use in the physical layer. There's your, your pinout uh, for your RS-232 cable. And, and in reality, if you like, like, if you, like I do, I make my own cables up a lot. I, you know, the, the ethernet cable that is going from this computer that I'm live streaming on, I made it myself out of, I have a whole spool of wire over there and I, you know, you have the tools, but you've got to make sure you, you understand what each pin is for. This is an RS-232 uh, type of DB9 connector and you'll use tools like I was just showing you. If you're having problems with communications, maybe you swapped a couple of those pins. So they sell tools and I had a whole box of them that I would use to make sure that, um, that, I, would, that I would get the right lights on the right pins when you're making and, and establishing your communication. Communications. Uh, that's a DB9. This is a DB15. Uh, that again, uh, this is your uh, just you know you, you've got to know what is pin one and what is pin 15, and then what does each what do each one of those pins what are they supposed to do? And they could vary. I as a manufacturer may say you need a DB9, and 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 you know the db9 rs232 could be pin one is data uh, pin two is received data but i might tell you no in my application when you're using my products pin one is not data carrier detect pin two is not received data i may des decide to do my own pin out and it's a proprietary cable that I use with my products so you got to be careful when you're buying solutions you may see a DB9 connector and just say, hey, I'm going to go over to Home Depot or I'm going to run over to Best Buy or whatever. I'm going to go online and get 30 of these puppies and I'm just going to use it. And you find out that, oh my goodness, no, this is a custom cable that is specific to that product and they need a specific pin out. And oh, by the way, you had to buy their cable. And oh, by the way, maybe the manufacturer doesn't even tell you what the pin out is. Okay, unless you unless you pry it out of their tech support guys, um, so you can make your own cables. So you've got to understand. Sometimes there's a level of proprietary, right? There could be a proprietary protocol. There could be proprietary hardware or conductors or um, data cables. Uh, where the pinouts are specific to that product, you've got to understand that. And if that's not something you want in your world, you don't want a proprietary protocol. You don't want proprietary pinouts. Then you need to specify that. And you may find out that nobody can quote it.
Okay. Um, SEL at Schweitzer does a lot of deviations on these connectors, even RJ45 is exactly right. And, and uh, JW, that's why, that is why uh, when I would be out on a job site, this is what I, I use this considerably because what I loved about this, and I don't even know if they make these in, this is a black box Tri-State Plus. Uh, black box Tri-State Plus. Uh, black box tri uh, CNET. I, I don't know what CNET is. CNET, isn't that? Yep, that's a, there's a kit. I don't even know that black box is in business anymore. I don't know. Data Connect. So in any case, I'm sure they, there's other people that make these, but what I loved about it was I could put the jumpers in and I can get the configuration, watch the lights go off and watch my communications work. And then I would know how I needed to modify my cables if I had the wrong cables. And there are uh, smaller connectors that you can use. I mean, it was, I had a box, when I would go out to a job site to get something to work, I had a, I had a whole box, which I turned into a bag because I had a fly. I had a whole bag of connectors and I had little connectors that you can jumper that were DB9s that I could manually put jumpers in to get things to work. And then I would make up my own cables. I had all the right crimpers and whatnot. So, um, but you gotta be careful. Uh, John McCamish, thanks for joining brother. Uh, Alan Bradley has some custom proprietary cables from many other exactly so you've got to th think about the custom and what's proprietary and what's not proprietary so there's your nine then your, there's your 25 pin connectors and and again i'm showing transmit receive my request to send my clear to send uh, my ground all that good stuff in in each of these pins but they could vary depending upon uh, the pin there's your rj11s that's your typical phone jack right um, and now i have used these connectors uh, in line drivers and one of the jobs that we did it was a large campus it was a military base on the east coast uh, that's all i'll say about that and they had a lot of meters across the entire infrastructure and they had a lot of existing phone lines between every building so what we did we used their existing phone lines we used these connectors those types of wires and we had what they call um, line drivers okay they would basically amplify a signal and i had a sending module and i had a receiving module so i had to figure out what these two ends like this end was in one building and the other end was in another building going through a switch and i had to make sure there was no um, electronic switches in there it had to be hardwired connections and they all were we had to ring it all out meaning i had to, i knew exactly which one of these rj11s in one building and what uh, a corresponding rj11 was in another building and then i would put a line driver that basically would take an rs232 or a, a signal amplify it put it over this can these conductors send it to a receiver that would take that data convert that back over rs-232 that went into another computer and that's how we did our data communications we used an existing network of all of their phone system and it worked like a freaking charm it was beautiful um and, and it's and it's magic when you see the lights light up and you go this stuff really works uh, and it was very reliable but very slow so the other thing you have to think about these mediums that you're picking what is the baud rate you're going to get out of it if i have like in that case i was using uh line drivers and i don't even know who makes these line drivers line driver um signal i don't know booster i'm just gonna see i don't know logitech might make them um line drivers audio um, line drivers data we were using a lot of at the time it was black box let me see if blackbox.com even works they probably are out of business i don't know hey black box is not out of business there we go they're there how can we support you black box products all right so um accessories cables they have cables um videos testers tools Control system, converters, 
modems that was the other thing that you could have is uh modems so you could take an rj11 into remember those uh the those whenever they would dial and it would answer and you'd have that negotiation uh you can communicate that way as well i mean you could use those types of modems um i'm gonna just do a line driver and see if there's um any line drivers up there resort nope i don't have any line drivers i can find but in any case I, that's that's the value of going live um so you can find uh, places where you have line drivers that will take an rs232 signal put that over a twisted pair maybe an rj11 or an rj45 or whatever it is and then retranslate that back over to rs232 on the other side so there's your RJ45. That is your typical computer uh, cables, you know, and you've, if you're going to do an Ethernet, I mean, you can go find the pinouts. I mean, that's what I did when I made this up. I just Google it. What's the pinout for Ethernet? It'll tell you from left to right, pin one to pin whatever, uh, what colors go where, and uh, you just put them in there and you crimp them. Line driver signal booster. Line driver signal booster. Booster. Yeah, there we go. It's line driver signal boosters. They got them at Best Buy, Amazon, signal boosters and Amazon, 10 times line level, RCA signal of a device. Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, and, and, and you know, what you want to do is find a good communication, somebody who has a lot of communication products and just basically say, look, I need to get from RS-232 to a phone connector and then from a phone connector back over to RS-232. Uh, and it could be a nine pin, it could be a 25 pin, uh, it could be an RJ45. I wanna get from an RJ45 to a phone connection. You know, you need to figure out what are the pins, what's my transmitter and receiver. And if you're going from RJ45 to a phone connector, you gotta think about what are my, I've only got, I've only got, uh, I think four, uh, four conductors, right? I got oh, one, two, three, four, five, I think five pins. Uh, I think there's five pins on a on an RJ11 uh, or an RJ12 and a, RJ11, RJ12, and then RJ45 has more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I got eight pins. Um, so your application will drive what that is, and you may need a custom cable. Um, and then there's your typical RJ45s. And then you have these. These are what you typically see in audio. Like my microphone is this type of a connector, a DIN connector. You have USB connectors now. Uh, you have USB A, B, you have mini A, mini B's, micro A's, micro B's, and you got these puppies here. And where I see the micro B's so that I'm pointing to right here, that's typically like on my um, my uh, two terabyte drives use this as a connector. Uh, and, and it's just, I think it has to deal with how many pins you need. You may not have a choice, right? So you've got to understand what are the pinouts that you need and, and how am I going to connect? So there's your physical layer. And it may be that you need these type of connections where you're physically connecting um, pinouts. And, and there's your transmit, your receives. How am I going to establish that communications? What do the pins mean? Those are your patch through or your crossover cables. You know, I might need to cross over because if I need one to talk to the other, I need to switch my transmit and receive so that this one listens to the transmit uh, on, and this one's looking for the receive on the right signals. Um, and, and, you know, you've, there's your shielding again, your transmit. There, so you have a physical connection and then you can create a wire that will go to a DB9 if you need to go to a DB9. Then you need to get it into a computer. You're going to need this type of a card that plugs into a computer slot that says, I'm going to take the data that's coming over those and plugs onto a motherboard. Or to Robert's point, this could be an external box that takes that RS-232 signal or an RS-45 signal, does something with it, and then outputs a different uh, connector, like maybe an RJ-11, or maybe it connects directly to the Ethernet LAN, and it puts data over there, and there's a little microprocessor on this board. So uh, it, it's just like you think about a printer. You buy a printer at the store. It's going to come with a cable, and typically that cable is going to be custom to that printer. You might say, hey, that, that's pretty standardized now, Tom. You know, I mean, it's all USB. But in, back in the day, there was those big connectors, and you plugged it into the printer, and then you plugged it into the port like this that was on your computer. 
And that was a, uh, it could be a standard USB port or a standard RJ9, uh, DB9 port. Um, or an RS-232 point, a port that was serial communications just with that printer. Um, and so, but, 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 and then you need the driver, right? So the driver in the computer microprocessor needs to talk to this board and, and, that, and then he has to understand the protocol. So you've got to think about all these things. If you're buying this because the manufacturer of the meter says you need this and you know what the cable is and you know how to connect to it, well, what are you going to plug this into? If you're going to plug it into a Microsoft computer, you need the Microsoft drivers. If you have an Apple computer and you're going to plug this into an Apple computer, you got to make sure that there's drivers for the Apple computer to talk to this board. And it may not be that they have a driver. You may have to figure out why well, I can't use this because this is only made for a Windows environment. So you got to think about every aspect of the connection. This is a board we make. That's your gateway. There's a microprocessor on there. There's memory on there. It plugs into your computer. You can bring your, it'll communicate with uh, all of our devices on the network. It has our protocols. Now the protocol, there's a ton of protocols. You got Modbus, there's different methods of Modbus. Modbus Plus, Modbus RTU, Modbus ASCII, Modbus TCP. You got Profinet, Profibus, DeviceNet, DNP3, BACnet, BACnet IP. Uh, SNMP, Active ASP, HTML, XML, File Transfer Protocol, FTP, OPC, DDE. Whoa. I mean, it gets really complicated. If I have Modbus devices that speak Modbus RTU, and I have Modbus devices that have Modbus TCP, can I daisy chain those on the same network? No, you can't. You can't have a Modbus RTU and a Modbus TCP on the exact same wire. So now you say, well, I've got five meters. Two of them are Modbus RTU and three of them are Modbus, or maybe two are Modbus RTU. Two of them are Modbus TCP. And I got this one device that's, um, I don't know, Profibus or DeviceNet. Well, how do I get all of those talking together? I may not be able to. I may have to create three different independent communication networks. One that speaks DeviceNet, one that speaks Modbus TCP, and one that speaks Modbus RTU, and treat each of those separately from a physical layer back to maybe I have a gateway, uh, a device that has a card that accepts Modbus RTU, has another card that has an Ethernet port that, that accepts Modbus TCP, and another port that accepts DeviceNet. And then in this box, I take and map all of my data and output maybe onto an Ethernet LAN, or maybe I'm going straight to a display and I'm displaying the data from each of those networks. So you've got to think about what is it that if you want everything to be on a Modbus network and say it's Modbus RTU, you better make sure you find equipment. Don't buy Modbus TCP because now you're, you're, you're done, right? Because now if, you're, uh, if your interface does not accept an on Modbus TCP data source, then you've got to get that converted from Modbus TCP over to Modbus RTU, and that's another converter. And every time you add converters or you change a data format from RS-232 to RS-45 back to RS-232, you're adding delays, you're adding time into the signal processing, which might be ungood. So you have a master-slave network or you have a peer-to-peer -peer network. Master-slave network is the master device, which would be the controller, says, I need information from you, David Engelhart, or you from Tamaki. And Tamaki or David's the only one who sends a response back. Or you, Chris Fo uh, Fo Foland, uh, Chris, I need to know your address. And then Chris will send back his address. Tamaki's not going to respond. Robert's not going to respond because I did not ask for it. But then the peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, if I, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, Tamaki might say, hey, I don't hear anybody talking, so I'm going to talk. And if Tamaki starts talking and Chris Fallen starts talking, then they both shut up and they wait for a time period. And then one of them starts talking. And then if Chris Fallen says, hey, I got something to say, but Tamaki's talking, I'm not going to talk. That is more of a dynamic environment. It's a peer-to-peer -peer type of situation.
Most of what I've seen is master slave. Peer to peer might be what like a computer network, Ethernet LAN. Uh, when you get to a daisy chain worth of devices, that's typically your master slave type of um, of communications. And this is just an expl explanation of how a peer to peer works. There could be a, a token where you say I'm, you have permission to speak, and it's passed through the network, uh, or it could just be multiple access collision detect. Uh, message structure. So here's another thing. So every one of the bits, so every protocol will tell you when I send a series of ones and zeros. So you might have a program that captures messages. Another really important aspect if you're trying to troubleshoot is to have a program that will glean the information off of the network and show you the raw data. I mean, that is like that is a troubleshooter's dream to be able to see the actual messages come back and forth. And then you can put them in a document and see, okay, I should have say 14 digits. The first one should be, um, you know, I don't know, a control bit. The second three should be the address. Whatever the protocol defines each bit to be, it's like a catalog number for a product. Right. Every digit in a catalog number has a meaning. Well, every digit in a protocol communication packet has a meaning and they're ones and zeros. So you will you can look at the data, look at all the ones and zeros and say, am I asking the right message? Am I getting clobbered? Is my I'm sending out one one zero 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 one zero one zero one but I'm getting something different in my monitoring. So it could be I've got, uh, I've got uh, a corrupt files. I could be that I have my data lines, my, my grounding and bonding isn't done correctly. My shielding isn't done correctly. I may not have put my terminating resistor in and I'm getting clobbered due to a reflective wave, all these different things. So being able to see the message is really critical when you're troubleshooting. But suffice it to say that when I have a structure, if I send a message out and every device knows that the first bit is going to be, uh, maybe it's if it's a one, it's a control message. And if it's a zero, it's a, a data message. If I don't understand that, I'm not going to know. I'm going to see the data hit me and I'm just going to sit there and go, well, I don't understand it. I'm, I, I, I don't speak that protocol. So I'm looking for something different or maybe the message is not even the right size because I don't speak that language. And, and, you, and you can't intermix. That's why the industry standards like Modbus and Modbus TCP, and you gotta be careful there because some people will throw their own little variations. Why would I throw a variation into Modbus? Well, maybe my device does so much more than what a standard Modbus device does. I need a method to get you my data and I have more data than Modbus permits me. So I need to come up with some little method to leverage the existing protocol, but then do something a little special to be able to give you more data that I have as uh, special for my functions. Like I might be able to give you waveform data and it might come back over a series of uh, of data streams of of data packets i might have to uh i might have to do my own little thing and say well when i send this out i'm going to put it into this mode and then um the data that's out there is going to be streamed up and when it's over then my modbus say my modbus master will say okay that's done i'm going to do this you know so you might have different flavors of Modbus, so you got to make sure that whatever it is you're purchasing and if you're buying, you got to understand that protocol. Are they adhering strictly to the protocol or are they doing some of their own little magic things to get that added value back to you? And if you are a programmable logic controller uh, and you're programming things, you need to understand all of these details on how every device communicates. It's really critical. Uh, and this is where the baud rates I should have had. That's, remember, that was a mistake in my slides. Um, so you have to define the sensor, the physical characteristics of the communication network. You have to have the protocol and you have to have the software. And remember, if I, it's just like any computer when you plug in a, a device, if I'm going to plug in a modem or if I'm going to plug in a printer, um, I need to have the drivers and what a driver is, it tells the microprocessor, it tells the operating system how to communicate with what you just plugged in. And we live in a world today where many, computer, many computers have drivers for 
the common printers that are out there and common devices that you're uh, that you're going to uh, plug into a computer because they have to build these systems so that every household can easily communicate. But if you're in an industrial environment and you're buying meters from say Schweitz or relays from Schweitz or relays from Eaton or, or meters from Eaton or e meters from somebody else, you're not in a residential environment. Drivers and uh, protocols are not as easy as it would be for a homeowner or a um, uh, another perfect person to just sit down and put it all together you're there's going to be a level of expertise needed because you have to deal with all the different protocols you have to deal with the physical layer structures and all of that great stuff tamaki says it's amazing that most devices detect whether they're connected to ethernet cables cross cable or straight cable automatically absolutely tamaki we've gotten more and more um <clears throat> sophisticated in establishing the communications um, back when i was doing things uh, it was very manual uh, but today with all of the drivers and whatnot uh, there's a, a lot of different ways to get that done so you know you'll have uh, this is just a small network you have i have a relay a meter a trip unit that's in a circuit breaker i have a a little energy device that's mounted on the bottom of a circuit breaker all of those are daisy chained over and using a belden 9463 twisted shielded pair there is a converter that gets it from that network whatever the protocol would be remember there could be custom there could be uh, proprietary protocols i know back in the day eden and westinghouse had incom incom was a frequency shift key very powerful protocol that would be able to pull a lot of data very fast and but i if i wanted to get it to rs232 then i needed a converter if i needed to take it straight to the ethernet LAN, i needed a converter uh, if I wanted to get it to Modbus because it was an, a proprietary protocol, if I wanted to get it over to Modbus, I needed a converter box in there. This is an example. If I, I go from modem to modem, I could have a computer in one part of the country and do it the old fashioned way and do a dial up modem. Why might I do that? Security reasons, right? I may not want to put data on the internet, regardless of the tunneling and all the protocols. I might want a physical telephone connection that one modem dials another modem it may sound archaic but from a security perspective i am controlling my environment it is a very good method to make sure that you don't have any influence from outside it is a computer through two modems that could be dial up it could be those 12 telephone twisted pairs and i could have these could be line drivers that are basically taking my rs-232 converting that over and putting it out on rs-45 network uh say modbus communications so uh, the, my physical layer my software layer all work together i could have a modbus network tcp modbus rtu i can have a device net network but i need a protocol converter and each one of these might have their own protocol converters that take it up to maybe an ethernet LAN, or maybe it takes it up to one common communication bus that it could all be Modbus, right? I could be, I could pull that information into Iconics, Wonderware, or Johnson Controls Medicis system. From an Iconics, from an HMI perspective, like Iconics or Wonderware, I could have a driver on my computer which i did not draw here but i could draw a driver um where is that i could draw um let's do that shape uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da that might be in the computer and call this a driver right and that driver is inside of a computer that could be uh, connecting to a physical layer that is pulling the information and OPC, Olay for Process Control, I believe that's what it stands for, and DDE, which is Dynamic Data Exchange, and I believe DDE was replaced by OPC, but in DDE and OPC, you're dealing with data points like watts and vars and volts, 
uh, you're not dealing with a file structure like maybe a waveform would be or, or logged data. This would be real-time exchange of parameters so that I can display on a human machine interface that would be like a Wonderware where I could have a one-line diagram and it can show me my voltages throughout the power distribution system. Um, I, I have a processor, I have analog inputs, I can take currents into current transducers into a microprocessor and then pull that information into a computer. I could have different communication lines, so I could have one string of meters that is talking one protocol, this string of meters is talking a different protocol, or they could be talking the same protocol, but they're in different locations and I'm bringing them back to a computer. I could have uh, one series of, of, of devices connected into a, and I'm showing a computer. That computer could be just a, a, a box that has a, um, a, an RS-232 port, or it could have a, a direct, a card inside there that is uh, uh, RS-485 or, or um, uh, an RJ-45 that brings in Modbus TCP and does the conversions uh, directly. I could, I could land a Twisted Shielded Pair on there if I wanted to. Depends upon the card I'm buying. You gotta think about the architecture. And then I have to have the drivers and then I can say, I'm connecting this to an ethernet network. It's on a LAN and now I'm communicating maybe Modbus TCP or I'm communicating communicating dynamic data exchange DDE or OPC if I'm communicating DDE or OPC then the software on each of those computers has to be able to read the data and share the information I could be doing local data logging on each of these computers the green ones and I could uh, I could I could have uh, data monitoring going on and logging, and then the remote computers could be FTP, file transfer protocol, can basically say, go down on a nightly basis and copy up text files. Or each of these computers could be writing data to a database that is somewhere hanging off of this network. I could, um, I could say, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to put in a, um, you're gonna love this, right? I'm going to have a, a, a data storage and I'm gonna put that directly on the ethernet LAN and in here is, um, I don't know, um, what's a SQL, right? SQL Server. I can have SQL Server and my data uh, in this system I could have, uh, based upon the software that's running on these computers, I could be pushing data into that SQL Server database and then I can have software on this computer that accesses that data and shows me trends and shows me format. So I could be logging energy data, I can be logging my voltage data if I wanna see um, all that good stuff. Open platform, uh, George, thank you, George. Open platform communications. Uh, I could have swore though there was uh, there was an Olay for process control. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Let me try OLE for process control. Yeah, look at that. Bada bing, bada boom. OPC Olay for process control, uh, object linking and embedding, and this and that's an important distinction uh, because <clears throat> what you're doing with OPC. You're taking an object. So, so remember, DDE was <clears throat> back in back in the '90s. That was uh, the way we transmitted data into a thing like Wonderware. But OPC is a different format. It's called Olay for Process Control. Just think about uh, you know the Olay type of deal. So in this case here, I have a couple different networks. I could have uh, these could be all speaking. Uh, these two up here could spe be speaking Modbus TCP or Modbus RTU. But I could have them on different networks because of they're in different gear. Um, or I, they can be in the same gear, but some of the meters talk Modbus RTU and some of them could talk their own proprietary protocol. Uh, I could have a meter like this one here that's connected directly to Ethernet. It has its own MAC address, it has its own TCP IP address. And then I can have these meters here. So I have to think about <clears throat> the architecture. Do I need to put a computer in between these meters 
And what's the role of that computer? If I need local data logging, say for example, I don't want to rely on my Ethernet LAN because it keeps going down, but I can create smaller local area networks. Uh, and, and I can consider both of these a little local area network, but via Modbus RTU, say, or Incom or whatever proprietary protocol or open protocols. And I could be doing local data logging hardcore right there which basically says hey if I lose my Ethernet LAN I don't have to worry about it because I have I have a um, we'll just do this because I have on board a SQL server and I'm storing data locally. And my networked SQL server is going to pull information out remotely later because if my LAN goes down, I don't want to lose data. Okay, so you've got to think about the architecture and where you're doing your data collection. What are the vulnerabilities from lost data? Because if you have, if your data is being stored on the Ethernet LAN through there and there's no local storage on that, that local, it could be, uh, just a network interface box that has a hard drive on it. Um, if my network goes down, then I'm not logging data. And, and, and that might be ungood. So you might need uh, to take an approach where you have, you have a SQL server that is up there on the internet, on the network, and you have SQL servers databases locally on each of these systems so you in this in this case here now you don't have the worry of oh my gosh my LAN is down I'm missing I'm missing energy data or because it's no longer logging to the SQL server so you've got to think about the data that you're getting and look I'm over an hour <laughs> Jeez, oh man I just can't do this in an hour you, you have to think about the data that you're getting, where you're storing it, the reliability of that data. You don't want to lose that data. And how do I get that SQL Server? And then uh, how do I make sure that I tie it all together? Okay, if you're logging, it's better to log locally. In fact, if you could log, if you could get... Um, if you could do something like this, if you, now the expense would go up, obviously. And I'm just using SQL, it might not be SQL Server, it could be text files. But if, if you've bought meters and equipment that stored data locally, that you could periodically go and grab and upload, now you're even better off because now it doesn't matter what happens because each meter is storing locally and now you can upload information. Uh, we do a lot of this with regard to capturing waveforms or or doing low uh, load demand local. So you'll store data and then the software applications, which are probably going to be proprietary. OK, because if it's in many cases, these meters provide more function than what a, uh, a uniform standard software application can actually deliver. OK, uh, or work with. So, for example, if I if in my IQ products, I can give you uh, all kinds of harmonic histogram information, all kinds of waveform information uh, in, in, in how I store those file formats. I, I mean, there's probably not something out there that is uh, generic that can handle the extent of data that some of my meters can give you. So I have to give you some sort of proprietary driver that would go on that first computer that would go on uh, on this computer would probably have some sort of proprietary driver that is communicating out here, gathering information and, and bringing it back to this computer and then either DDE or OPC back to some HMI back up in this, into the system. Um, and, and again, this could be a local display like this here may not be a computer. It could be a piece of hardware that's sharing information. It could be just a display. And all it is is a translator that gets this data onto the Ethernet LAN and no data storage. 
So there's there's hardware in here and you've got to understand every bit and piece of hardware that you need. You may say, I bought the meter, but you found out that, oh my goodness, I need to buy a communication module that mounts on the back dependent upon the protocol. There may be a communication module for RS-45, a communication module for our, uh, uh, Modbus RTU, another communication uh, model for Modbus TCP or Ethernet or TCP IP. There might be different modules depending upon the protocol for the network that you plan to place it on. So you're gonna to wanna to talk to the manufacturer and make sure that there it is clear on what you're trying to get it into. You might have in this system over here, you might have a um, Johnson Controls Medicis system, right? You might have a Johnson Controls Medicis system and you have uh, these meters that you wanna get information in there. You're gonna to wanna to tell your supplier, I need to get your metering information into my Johnson Controls Medicis system because the Johnson Control system, you're gonna probably need and, and, and if these are proprietary communication protocols, you're going to need a converter. You're going to need, you're going to need it to get it from protocol X, possibly to Modbus, right? Modbus or whatever, and then, then over to the JC system. So you might have multiple layers of conversion. I did one job that was Conatel 2020. I had to take... I had a computer, uh, I had a whole bunch of devices and there was a, a computer that was here. I had another computer here and in between I had an RS-232 network and I had multiple, I had a card that had an octopus out, which had I think nine different RS-232 channels. So I had both computers had these cards that were an octopus and I, and I, I would connect all of those together the the one box took my all of my metering different information which was multiple manufacturers converted it over to a modbus register going out through each port and then the second computer took all those modbus registers in and converted it to conatel 2020 and put that out over to another system and the customer said i want a two second, no longer than a two second latency between status changes. So I had to set it all up, change the state of one of the contacts and show that I got a status indication on the Conatel network faster or equal to two seconds. That was a chore. And it was a dealing with the processor speeds, dealing with the scanning speeds and how many devices we had on every system. So you've got to think about how many devices are you scanning? How fast do you want to see a data change? What is the data that you're bringing up? If it's a status indication of ones and zeros, you know, one is being on, zero is being off. I can get through a bunch of those really fast. I can get through the status on whether or not anything is into an alarm feature. So if I have any device that's into alarm, I can scan for alarms very fast and then go back and get data. And in many cases, the drivers and software can help with the control of how you pull all of those devices. It can get very complicated very fast. I can have a simple network that just goes to a local display inside of a piece of equipment. Um, I don't know what that is discard all right so and i had a previous one all right so, uh, so when you think about communications and you're thinking about getting information back you got to think about the physical layer i'm talking the conductors down to the connectors are you landing on a terminal block do you have to make custom cables up uh, are they rj45s rj11s what are the pinouts for those do you need to get a twisted shielded pair? Do you need to think about the shielding and grounding? How are you gonna handle the grounding? Reference IEEE standard 1100. Uh, reference documents, books like Understanding Data Communications by Gilbert Held. If, you, if you're just tuning in earlier in my video, I actually put the link up there for you. Great reference book. Uh, if you're coming into a computer, you're going to need someone who completely understands drivers. You need to be the administrative uh, administrator on that computer because you're going to have to configure drivers. And remember, you're not in a residential world anymore. You're dealing with meters and relays. They have their own communication protocols. They're probably going to come with cards or, or, or uh, boxes that are going to be plugged into your computer or have software 
that's going to have to communicate out ports, uh, Ethernet ports uh, um, through your through your internet that your normal security guys are going to go. You're not going to use that port. That port's closed down uh, for security reasons. So you, you're going to have to think about cybersecurity and how do you island yourself from the internet to get what you need to get done. I know in many cases we had to work with the local IT departments. We had to create our own local area network with all of our uh, routers and hubs. You know, uh, what are the industrial routers and industrial hubs? Are you using Netgears? Are you going to go to Best Buy and get yours? Are you going to go to Black Box and get yours? Are you going to get yours on Amazon? What are the ratings of all of those equipment? Where can you install it? What are the limitations of those? Um, are, do you are you going to rely on the standard little connectors where they could break and or, or are you going to uh, try another method to make sure that your connector is solid in there? There's a lot of different things you need to think about on the physical layer. Then you get to the protocol layer. The meters, if you want to standardize on one protocol, make sure you standardize on that protocol. Make sure you understand the meters that you're buying, the relays that you're buying, whatever it is, what protocols do they speak? Where are the, how are you going to put those on? And um, how are you going to make sure that all communicates together uh, in back to whatever it is? And then, and, and what is the HMI? Is it an Iconics? Is it Wonderware? Is it um, uh, Johnson Controls Medicine System? Is it some other building management system that's custom, that's proprietary? They may have requirements that says, hey, we take in dynamic data exchange. We take in Olay for process control, OPC. We take in XML, okay, uh, or HTML active server pages, all these different methods, you need to understand how you're going to get the data from hard of R. And then if you're going to store data, is it going to a Microsoft Access database? Is it going to a SQL server? Is it going to an Oracle database? What is that database? And then what are the drivers that are going to make that happen? It can get complicated pretty doggone quick, um, but you have to think about that. Um, Chris Fullen says his work is renewable energies and they meter everything in their buildings. With that, we also have issues and I now have a better understanding of what I'm looking at and how to troubleshoot it. Yeah, Chris, hopefully this, hopefully this overview, I mean, uh, it can get complicated and especially once you get on the ethernet land. Now you're dealing with TCP IP, MAC addresses, okay? Uh, you're dealing with MAC addresses, IP addresses, whether you need a static IP address or if it's dynamic. So here's another problem. I've had a driver on a computer that had to communicate with a specific device that was on the TCP IP network. It was a meter uh, that had a communication module that tied straight into the Ethernet LAN. Every time this meter would power down for whatever reason, power back on, it would get a new IP address and the drivers were looking for an IP address not a MAC address. So I had to make sure because the driver was looking for a TCP IP address, which could change, I had to set it up on the network as a static IP address. And that's going to take going into your routers and make sure that that static address is, is in the router as a static IP address so it doesn't try to give one out so you don't have duplicate IP addresses on the network. If you have something that's a static IP address and the network has already given that IP address out, then you're going to clobber your communication. So you need to make sure the router and the, the system that's giving out the IP addresses understands that there is a TCP IP address that is static and not to use it. Uh, your best bet is to try to go by the MAC address associated with, and that's an ARP thing. Uh, you can look that up, but you, now you're getting into, you need the technical expertise for networks, TCP IP networks and uh, Microsoft. And I used to, I used to know all there used to, all there was, and I used to set up those lands, but that was a long time ago. Uh, I would definitely seek the help of, a, of an expert uh, these days who have the Microsoft knowledge uh, and the, um, uh, and the, and the, uh, the routers and, um, uh, and hubs and all that good stuff. And, and so it, it can get complicated pretty doggone quick. All right, so I went through the physical layer, I went through the protocol layer, and I did not do it in an hour, I did it in an hour and a half, and I apologize for that again. Uh, be, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna stop at this point. Hopefully um, you got something out of this uh, session that we had today. And um, 
All right. Okay, so I'm good to go. I hope you're good to go. I thank you for tuning in today. This Tech Thursday, it's been over two weeks or just about two weeks or something like that since I've gone live. And um, I appreciate uh, everybody hanging in there. So remember, uh, stay safe, please. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit the thumbs up. Leave me some comments. I love those. Uh, and uh, uh, JW, I love the questions. Keep those things coming. Chris Fallen, great. George, all those guys, everybody out there who's uh, participating, please ask those questions. Um, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, please. Hit the bell. You'll be notified. Uh, don't forget to check me out on all of my most social media platforms. I'm on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I go live on Twitter as well. I go on uh, Instagram. I'm, I'm trying to learn Instagram um, and um, Facebook. So Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. I am not keeping up on the whatever that other clubhouse uh, was. I'm losing interest pretty doggone quick. But those five platforms we stream to. So thank you. I didn't stream to Instagram because I forgot to do the yellow duck the way it goes okay thanks everybody thanks for joining in thanks for what you do for electrical safety and the electrical industry take care stay safe see you next week i'm going to be teaching next week probably driving on tuesday i might not live stream next week i'm going to try this uh atm mini pro maybe from my hotel room i don't know we're going to try something, uh, but next week's going to be sparse as well because of uh, training. Training. Oh, Susan, thanks for joining in. Susan Newman, thank you very much for joining in, Susan. Miss you. All right, everybody. Thanks and take care. Stay safe. God bless. And uh, please stay healthy. Signing off for now. That was fun, wasn't it? Not... All right. I'm trying to, oh, there we go. All right, I'm gonna sign off. Thanks everybody, take care. Tamaki, thank you very much. See you hopefully next week. I'm trying, I'm gonna try. I am uh, gonna be traveling. I'm teaching a 70E class next week, so I might not be able to live stream, but I'm gonna do everything I can uh, to be able to do that. Maybe I'll record something and post it. You never know. <laughs>